This morning with me, please. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 34. And we open the pages of the infallible, inerrant, eternal, plenary, verbally inspired, living word of the living God. Amen, Amen folks. Luke chapter number 2, verse number 34. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Father, anoint the word and anoint the messenger. Open the hearts, open the ears, that they may receive the truth. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This is Simeon, and he's held this little baby in his hands and said, Behold my salvation of the Lord, right here. And of course, you all understand, this was on the eighth day when he was circumcised. And the, uh, and the prophecy that's given here is very clear, that a sword shall pierce through thine own soul. Simeon knew that Christ would be crucified. He knew it right then. He knew he held the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist called him. So what does that mean? That means that it's God's Lamb. God offered a Lamb. And he offered this Lamb as the sacrifice for our sins. Isaiah chapter 53 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should behold him. He is despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his straps we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. This is what's called the vicarious suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ dying in my stead. It must always be remembered that Christmas is a beautiful time of the year, no question. We are celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the advent of Almighty God when he came into this world. But this is for a purpose. Christmas is not for Christmas. Christmas is the time looking forward to God's Son who has come into this world. Why did he come? This is what's so important. He didn't come to bring peace to the earth. He said, I came to bring a sword. He didn't come to establish a kingdom that would be rejected. He will build his kingdom. Why did he come? He came as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Matthew chapter 27 verse 35 says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. He had nothing. All he had was the clothes on on his back and they took that from him. He hath no place to lay his head. He didn't fly in $60 million airplanes. He was poor, amen. The Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head, he said. Yet through his poverty we can become rich, amen. The King of Glory came down to the world, and laid aside that glory, and put upon a head, they put upon his head a crown of thorns. But that's okay because he, the thorn represents the curse upon the ground, and so he bore the curse in his body to remove it from the ground. Amen. So one day the death of the Lord Jesus Christ will be realized by every living thing regardless of what it is. So what does it mean that he was crucified? To the apostles that lived in his day, it meant that he went outside, they took him outside Jerusalem and nailed him on a cross. That's what it meant to them. And they understood that fully and completely. But it was not until the Apostle Paul was called and taken into Arabia that the full doctrine of the cross was to be revealed. 
There may be in my mind the place that in Arabia, he may very well have gone to the very spot that Moses received the Ten Commandments. He may have gone to the very spot where Moses was placed in the cleft of the rock. He may very well have walked in the very footsteps of Moses. Why, preacher? Because he and Moses were two that brought the revelation of God to mankind. Moses carried the Ten Commandments, commandments from the top of that mountain down to his people having been in the presence of God. And so the Apostle Paul, he said when he was saved in Galatians 1, he said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. He said, but I went into Arabia and there I stayed and God began to reveal to me what I preached to mankind. Mankind. You reject the Apostle Paul, throw the rest of it out. Because he, as A.T. Robertson of Louisville said, he is the interpreter of Christ. The Apostle Paul is. So what does it mean? The Apostle Paul used the term cross ten times. Eleven if he wrote Hebrews. And when he used this, he used it in the sense of theology. What does it mean? How does it affect you? What was God's purpose in the cross? He used it in that sense. He made sense of it as the purpose of God with mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ did not fall into the hands of killers. He was not taken out somewhere and killed. No man took his life from him. He said, I lay it down of myself. The Bible talks about him bearing his cross. When I read that, I think to myself, my, what a heart. What a man. What someone that would bear his cross for you and for me. I'm so thankful unto God for that. It is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that makes all the difference. It's not about any religion. It's not about morality. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about the government or politics. It's about the one who went to the cross. And there he suffered and he died. The cross was used by the Romans as a place of execution. But it was also used as a place of terror. He, they terrorized the people. Imagine your daddy hanging on the cross. Imagine your mother standing there at the foot of the cross and your father dying. Imagine days on end and the, and the, and the, and the, and the birds come down to peck his eyes out. Imagine as the sun bakes upon his body and you're watching your father die. You tell me that that's not terror? The Romans were good at terrorizing. And this was known from the foundation of the world. Before the first man was ever made. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So they saw crucifixions. They knew what crucifixion was. And the Lord Jesus Christ was not pushed off of a hill at Nazareth. He would not drown in the Sea of Galilee. He would not be taken somewhere against His will and put to death. He was to die on the cross. And so my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ gave Himself 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I can't emphasize this enough this morning. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ finished it. It was at that cross he said it's finished. To Tetelestai. It means that it's complete. Nothing can be added to it. This means that any of your ability, any of your penance, any of your baptisms, any of your church membership, anything you think you can do or add to that, my dear friend, is nothing but dead works. You cannot add to what Christ did on the cross. For what he did on the cross, he completed. The Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth says, God sent me not to baptize, but preach the gospel. A few years later to the church at Ephesus, he says, there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And he defined what that was. He said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That one baptism is a spirit baptism that places us into the body of Christ. Amen. So the Apostle Paul threw it out. The Apostle Paul established that salvation is by grace through faith. Plus none is nothing and minus nothing. 1 Corinthians 1.18 He said for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us it is the power of God it is which are saved. It's the power of God. Now here's why this is important. 
The world is full of pride. They're motivated by pride. They're motivated, motivated by accomplishment. They're motivated by, by the projection of strength. And my dear friend, when you think about a man who died on a cross 2,000 years ago being the only hope of your salvation, you are dealing with people who think that is pure foolishness. But until you give up that pride, until you bow on your knees, until you cry to God and ask for mercy, you will, my dear friend, be lost and there will be no hope for you. And this is why it's called foolishness. For Galatians 5 verse 11 says, And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The cross is offensive. Galatians 6.12, as many as desire to make a fair show of you in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The Paul, the gospel that Paul preached is Christ plus nothing. And it was a stumbling block to all those who heard him in that day who wanted to revert back to the Judas, Jewish Judaism or even to the pagan gods of the Gentile world. He was trying to tell them that Jesus Christ and him alone can save. And he pointed them to the cross. Now I want you to get a hold of this this morning. This is important. We know that he rose from the dead. Don't you know that? Hallelujah, he arose. Christ lives, he lives, he lives. But let me tell you something this morning. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ really doesn't mean anything to you till you've been to the cross. Till you've been to the cross. Because it is at the cross where your life is changed. It is at the cross where you come face to face with God. It is at the cross where you really begin to understand what you're made out of. And so we preach Christ and Him crucified. To the Jew it's a stumbling block. To the Greek it's foolishness. But to us who are saved it is the power of God. And the salvation to everyone that believeth. So I want you to think with me this morning why this is so important. Because the cross of, cross of Christ is made fun of today. The apostle said in Galatians 6, 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. The apostle said in Philippians 3, 18, For many walk of whom I told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. I read an article the other day said, get ready for a tsunami of pastors falling away from the faith and embracing homosexuality. Embracing the pop culture of America. And it is pop culture. I've lived too long. I know what it used to be like. And men are losing their minds today. The church is embracing anything and everything. And they're going to love everybody. Let me tell you what love is. Love is to warn you that there's a fire. Yeah. Whoa, love warns you that you've got a problem. Love tells you that you don't seek to make yourself better. Love tells you there is no hope outside the Lord Jesus Christ. That's love. That's love. It's not some made up mushy, mushy nothing. So the apostle says there be no boasting in his presence. Now don't you listen carefully to what I'm going to read. Ephesians 2.16, the Bible said him that he might reconcile both into God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Boy, what does that mean, preacher? It means that there was an anger between God and man. Man had violated holiness. The Ten Commandments, commandments, all of the rights and wrongs and do's and don'ts are not important until you understand that they are nothing in the world more than the manifestation of a holy God. Amen. That's what they're for. They make you stop in your tracks and say, wait a minute. I've tried my best to keep the commandments, but I still fail. I've come up short of my, my own projections, my, my New Year's resolutions. I still fail. What can I do? And what you can do is to accept what he's done. Colossians 1.20 And have he made peace through the blood of the cross. By him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. 
Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Boy, that's called the titleist. And they would hang the charges of the condemned over their head or around their neck. And so they could bear to be seen in public all of the accusations and charges. And they were, they were guilty of Barabbas, he said. Stood here next to them. He was guilty of sedition. He was a murderer. And he, Pontius Pilate said, surely if I appeal to their just sense, if I appeal to the, if I appeal to the heart of this mob, there's no way that they're going to choose Barabbas over Christ. But what did they say? Give us Barabbas. Charles Spurgeon, 150 years ago, made note of this. He said, the name Barabbas is a conjunction of two Hebrew words. Bar in Hebrew means son. And the word Barabbas means Abba. What is an Abba? It's father. So it literally means son of his father. That's quite a name. Don't you think? Barabbas was the son of his father. What did the Lord Jesus say in John 8, 44? He said to the Jews, you are of your what? Father the devil. You can walk out of this house today choosing another father. Amen. Amen. You can say, Lord, I've had enough of this. I've been playing games too long. How many's ever heard of Johnny Erickson Tata? I've loved her from day one. Uh, she had a book out 40 years ago and showed her with a brush in her mouth and she's painting. And I thought, this is such a lady. And I've listened to her on the radio. I heard her this morning before I came to church and she said this. She said when she was a teenager, 17, 16, 17, 18 years old, she said she told God, she said, Lord, she said, help me. I'm, I'm getting tired of playing at Christianity and just kind of you know, haphazard, uh, laid back, cavalier attitude. She said, Lord, I want to live for you. I want my life to count for you. And she said it wasn't any time after that that she dove into that water. And you know what happened to her? She became a quadriplegic. And on the bed, she started thinking about that prayer. And God certainly did get a hold of her. And he changed her. And from that day until this day, she has blessed countless millions. She has given people hope. There are people out there, the folks that are, that, are, that are injured. There are people out there that are hurting. And they need hope. They need to think, can God do something for me? Yes, He can. Yes, He can. Are your eyes still healed? Yes. Did God not touch you? Yes. I, don't, I can't, listen to me. I'll never explain to you why God chooses to heal this one and not that one. But when He does heal this one, I give Him glory. If he doesn't heal that one, he's still God. But here's a dear sister right here. Her eyes were hurting her. She was in pain. She was anointed with oil. Did the oil heal her? No. Did I heal her? No. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, he healed her. And he can heal you. He's able to build hope back in your soul. So, the twelve knew nothing of this. They didn't understand these great doctrines that the apostle was preaching. This is not to belittle the twelve, but it's simply said, put it in context. When you throw the apostle Paul at, you've thrown out the New Testament, you've thrown out the heart and soul of it. Yeah, you have. Romans 5, 10, For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we should be saved by His life. Then 2 Corinthians 5, 19, To wit, God was in Christ... Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. What does it mean? It means that God solved the sin problem. That's what it means. It means that at the cross at Calvary, as far as God was concerned, sin's finished. Amen. I don't understand that. Sin's finished. As far as God's concerned, the enmity between God and man, he's at peace with man. That's important because I hear an awful lot of preaching and they, bra they drag the God of the Old Testament in and they try to preach Him to people and they don't realize that He stopped at Calvary. That's as far as He went. And this is my Son. I'm going to put on Him the iniquity of us all. 
made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. I can't say to you this morning that I can explain to you all that's involved in that, but I know that in California there's a man out there that's killed a hundred people. He's killed a hundred people. We got people locked up in the prisons right now that are cannibals. They not only kill, they eat. We've got ten, and I've read what they, some of them say. They say, what you start, what you start killing, they say, that you have this feeling of power. You're taking a life. You get this powerful feeling and you get a bloodlust. And so you have to satisfy, you get addicted to it. And this is what happened to Bundy. Bundy was addicted to killing. And you've got serial killers out there right now walking the streets, folks. They're addicted to killing. Christ died for them. He died for the root of that evil. He became sin for us who knew no sin. There are people right now locked up down here in maximum security that are watching preaching. I don't know if they're watching this in particular. But if you are, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you did it to. Christ became your sin at the cross. That means you can be forgiven. Hallelujah. I'd like to hear that if I were down there, wouldn't you? It's a sure sign of the decline of a culture is murder. Johnny Majors is the uh, former coach at UT. Well known. Everybody knows Johnny Majors. His great niece was going to school in New York City. His great niece. And she was assaulted. She was, uh, she was robbed, I think. But eventually... Two or three boys that gathered around began to stab her. They stabbed her to death. But she was, this girl had, she was courageous. Even though she had mortal wounds in her body, she climbed up some steps and tried to get up to a point where she could tell people what had happened to her. And now they've arrested a 13-year-old boy Amen. for murder. 13 years old. If I were that crowd up there on Capitol Hill, if I were all those black robed judges that have kicked God out of school and have ripped the Ten Commandments from our nation, somebody has got to take the responsibility for innocent blood that's being shed. Amen. Amen. You take freedom away from people. You take God away from them. You take light away from them. You take their soul away from them. What have they got left? And that's what they're living with right now. They got nothing left. They're raised up as animals. They go out and they kill. They have no regard for human life whatsoever. Amen. Amen. Who's to blame? Well, I'll tell you right now, I don't want to be that crap. You understand something, Supreme Court judge? You're going to stand before the God of the universe. You understand that, Senator? You understand that, Representative? You understand that, President? Do you understand that, Mayor? Do you understand that, whoever you are? You're going to stand before the God of the universe. And when you stand before Him, you will be so meek and so weak and so humble and so defeated and so small. Because you're going to stand before that eternal, almighty being. You better think about that before you leave this old world. The rapist, what about him? Violates people. What about the perverts, sodomy and lesbianism? They emasculate men. My wife told me yesterday, she said, listen to this. And here's this, here's this boy on there, 18, 19, 20 years old, young man, I don't know how old he was, singing. I said, you got to be kidding. She said, no. Sounded like a girl. They got the boys now singing like girls. They're emasculating them. They're taking their manhood away from them. You see, that's what, that's what feminism has done to us. It's destroying our nation. It's destroying young people. A girl, a young woman, a young lady should be raised up in respect and should be honored because of her gender. She should one day be a mother. She's somebody's mother. She's a wife. She should be respected for that. There was a time when, when men would fight and die for a woman. For her honor. Now, they've blurred the lines between the genders. Now they're raising the boys up and they don't know whether they're a boy or a girl. 
transgenderism. See what they're doing to you folks. Do you see what I'm here? You listening to me? They, 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 these social engineers are messing with your mind. Right. And people today don't even know how to make a clear decision. He died for that too. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Bless your righteous name, Lord. Bless your name. I am so thankful he could take a dog like me, save him, and give him a ministry and call me to preach. Lord, have mercy. You wouldn't know how dark it was where I came from. No, you don't. You don't know how dark a hole I came out of. Jeremiah sunk in the pit and the, and the mud and the, and the grime and the slime reached up around him and he sunk in. That's where God found me. In the slime. And he pulled me up. You think I would thank him for my life and for every moment of my life and for every breath that I breathe? I owe him everything I am. I owe him. Well, it all leads to the cross. It all leads to the cross. And if you can't be brought to the cross, you'll never know God. I'm going to close with this. Psalm 22. Those of you that read the Bible, you should know this immediately, what we're reading. Psalm 22. And turning there, I'm going to read this for you. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. See how the apostle says it? Not just death, but the death of the cross. It was a shameful thing. And the Bible said he despised the shame. And you can get into detail this morning talking about what all went through. And what they Imagine a body, imagine a body hanging on a cross for three or four days. Imagine that. You understand? Bodies have bodily functions. You understand? And there they hung in shame for days. Now, how long was Christ on the cross? Six hours. You all know that. He was on there for six hours. Six hours. Then he gave up the ghost and said, Father, into thy hands I come in my spirit. I love him for that. I do. I love him for that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Christ was born. A thousand years. And those Jews, the Sadducees and Pharisees and the elders and the, and the, and the temple elders and all, they knew this. They knew what Psalm 22 said. If they hated him so much, they would never have said what Psalm 22 says that they said, but they couldn't keep from saying it. <laughs> they had to say it because the Lord Jesus says not one jot or one tittle will fail. It will come to pass. It will. A thousand years before Christ was crucified. When you get home, read Psalm 22. Read Psalm 22. If that's not a crucifixion, I don't know what is. Psalm 22. It is a detailed account of a crucifixion. Lord Jesus, I give you my life today. Do you? I may never see the sun rise again. That's okay. I'll see the sun. I'll see him. I'll see him as he is. I woke up 2 o'clock this morning. It's not unusual. I get up 2 o'clock all the time. I'm up and down, up and down, up and down. I woke up at 2 o'clock, laid there till 3 o'clock, and I said, Lord, I said, I got to preach today, and I need a little rest. And I'd only had about two or three hours sleep. I was asleep in five minutes, just like that. And there's no explaining it except that God just put me to sleep. And I slept for two more hours. I got up at 5 o'clock this morning, having slept about six hours maybe, and I feel good. <laughs> if I get six hours of sleep, I'm doing good. Amen. You get to where you can get by on a lot less than you think you can. God answered my prayer. Why don't you come down here today and talk to him let him answer yours. Why don't you come down to the cross. Let me tell you something you'll find at the cross. You'll find a big hand. It's the big hand of God. And you can take hold of that hand at the cross, folks. Red, yellow, black, white, rich, poor, bond, free. Your ethnicity has nothing to do with it. The, land, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. For whosoever, let him come. 
Won't you come down and take hold of that big hand? Come take hold of it. Won't you do that? Bow your head for a minute. Father, I've done what you call me to do, Lord. You know that. I'm your messenger. <laughs> and I'm happy being your messenger. Lord, I'm, I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. I'm doing what I know you want me to do. I'm your messenger. But Father, I'm done. I'm finished. And now it's the work of the Holy Ghost. Lord, help us this morning. There's somebody in here. I hate to see them get up and walk out of here and not get any help. I hate to see somebody come in here loaded to the gills with sin, condemnation, doubt. Father, I pray for them. I pray that they'd come to the cross. Put that hand up and take hold of that big hand reaching down from heaven. And get a hold of God. You can do it at the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.